Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's DCRI Research Conference. Um, thank you for the folks who were able to show up uh, live, online, and uh, because of our inclement weather, we recognize some people might be watching this later. But it's a real treat today to have Ziad Jalad with us. Um, I think I'll make a few comments about sort of setting the stage for his presentation. You know, when we think about performance measurement in healthcare, we often think about clinical measures. But there's an, another, there's an entire another dimension to measuring quality, efficiency of care that relies on a completely different set of skills and science. And today we're going to hear about systems engineering techniques, which are often used to help decide, uh, sorry, drive efficient management of healthcare resources and support medical decision making. And Ziad's been uh, a local leader in this, and today we're going to hear about his work with simulation-guided systems redesign of GI endoscopy. Prior to coming to Duke, uh, Ziad started off at Haverford College, followed by Johns Hopkins, where he did his MD and MPH, and came to Duke for his internship, residency, and fellowship in gastroenterology. Joined the faculty in 2009, and has been uh, very successful in his independent career. Now has a VA Career Development Award, um, works with the HSRD as well as here at the DCRI. So please join me in welcoming Ziad. All right. Thank you, Abdul. This is a nice, intimate group, so this is good. I was going to make a joke about this. You know, I think there's a spot there, but uh, um, so this is good. So thanks for coming, and um, you know, obviously it's a small group. I'm happy to make this a conversation and hopefully um, spark some some interest or some conversation around this. Um, there's the code. I think the code will be there at the end as well. So um, for CME, okay. So the 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 topic is simulation guided systems redesign and GI endoscopy. Um, I do want to thank Optil for the invitation, although, you know, to be perfectly candid, I invited myself, so this is what I get. Right? <laughs> but, uh, but it is a pleasure to, to be here. And I, and I did want to talk, you know, I haven't really shared a lot of this work with the DCRI, um, and there aren't a lot of people who do this kind of work here, so I thought this would be a good setting to, um, to kind of talk about this and set the stage for where I hope to go next with it. So the objectives of the talk today are to introduce health systems engineering as a core discipline of health delivery science, demonstrate the application of simulation to improve efficiency um, in GI endoscopy, and then to highlight the use of the electronic health record uh, as a key source of data for some of this work. I think there's a real opportunity to increase the amount of work that we do in this now that we've switched here at Duke to Epic and um, now that we've got um, EHRs across many institutions. So let me start with the first, but I, I do want to start with this. So I, I, probably not, but for those of you who may have been at my Grand Rounds in 2011, um, I had this slide as well, but it still, I think, drives a lot of my interest in this area. And so for those of you who are in clinic, um, you might recognize this. So I found myself repeating this over and over again um, in the endoscopy unit, who's on first? And this is an Abbott Constella routine from the 1930s. Um, where Abbott and Costello are going back and forth in this kind of comedy of confusion. Um, and if you can read it there, you'll see why it kind of gets confusing. And I realized this is how I felt in the endoscopy unit. Um, over and over again, I sort of mutter myself, who's on first? Um, and, and I recreated kind of an adaptation of what that was like here. And you could recreate this in a cath lab or on the floor. But Costello says, well, who's in room one? Abbott says, yes. I mean, the fellow's name, who? The guy in room one. Who? How about recovery? What's in recovery? Back and forth, back and forth. You know, nobody really feeling like they had control of the system in which they were operating. And this is, I think, is sort of what drives me to this work is that this chaos, I think, um, has consequences. And it has a number of consequences, um, clinical in terms of medical errors, poor patient experience, work culture consequences. I think this drives people crazy, not just physicians, but um, nurses and other staff. It leads to decreased morale and increased stress. Um, and then it has financial consequences in terms of the inefficient use of financial resources and, and resulting in um, sort of to borrow a term from GI, a bloated healthcare system. So it has real confusions. Um, it has real consequences, sorry. And I think that that's in part what's given rise to this concept of healthcare delivery science or this new field of healthcare delivery science. Um, and you know, I think, so Jim Kim articulated it much, much better than I did. Um, and this is from an editorial he wrote in Healthcare, which is a new implementation science journal, um, which was started in 2013. So as you can see, he says, when it comes to our most cherished social goals, we have an inexplicably high tolerance for poor execution. 
Downplaying execution has been seen our proof that our minds are focused on high ideals, not bogged down in the mundane mechanics of implementation. And he goes on to say this confusion has compromised healthcare in the United States and is uh, no longer acceptable. And so I, you know, this was sort of a, th this really gave me a charge, you know, because I, as I felt like I knew I was never going to win a Nobel Prize, and I knew uh, no Lasker Award was in my future, but I did think that the work really had um, had the potential to have a significant impact on the experience of care among patients, um, and also I think on the quality of care. And, and in fact, if you go back to this document, which is um, this was from 2001, Institute of Medicine crossing the quality chasm, and whether it's this or the um, 1999 document on on errors in medical um, care, you know this was when when the, the quality movement really took off, I think, and became mainstream. And in this document, they outlined six dimensions of quality, and a lot of the decade after 2001 was spent on these three. So, was safe, you know, was healthcare safe? Is it effective and is it equitable? A lot of the papers in health services research were really focused on those areas. And I think you know, these areas, in terms of patient-centeredness, timeliness, and efficiency, were not really emphasized. Now, that's, of course, changed. We have PCORI now. Um, it's OK to talk about efficiency, and timeliness of care is certainly important. So I think we're shifting a little bit to thinking about quality beyond just the traditional areas of safety and efficacy. Um, and health systems engineering um, is a discipline that um, I think is ideally suited to, to tackle those, um, those areas that have been neglected. And this document, Building a Better, Better Delivery System, is another Institute of Medicine report. This is from 2005. Um, and it was a combination with the Institute of Medicine and the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and they um, basically put forth the idea that, that systems engineering was a way um, to address kind of the needs of the delivery system. So operations research methods uh, were used in world, after World War I, you can see, to create highly reliable, safe, efficient, customer-focused systems in a number of key areas in the United States, transportation, manufacturing, telecommunications, and finance. And I think that um, it will escape no one that the same words, reliable, safe, efficient, customer-focused, are things that people are talking about in healthcare now. And so these same methods that were used to focus on the, the, these other big industries, I think now can, can apply to healthcare as well. So, and this is, you know, this, this idea is, is, is continued to develop. This is from a, um, an editorial by Chris Castle and Robert Saunders from the National Quality Forum last year in JAMA, where they wrote that um, healthcare delivery transformation is essential, uh, and they go on to say that systems engineering science should become a core function for improving the health of all Americans. So it's really, Again, I think coming sort of out of this um, uh, engineering and operations focused world into the health services uh, domain. Um, and this is the definition that, if you look at the NC State site, they include, which I think is nice because it highlights that you can use these methods to focus on clinical operations, but that um, you can also use them to think about treatment choices um, and other supply chain issues. But the goal, again, is to create a high quality system that lowers cost. That is, uh, at its essence, what health system engineering is, is looking to do. Um, and there's been a couple other reports I just wanted to highlight. These are in press, actually. So um, ISPOR has a task force on applying simulation modeling um, in healthcare delivery research, and they have a checklist now. Um, so as much as I, I enjoyed being able to submit a journal article without a checklist, now I have a checklist that I have to, uh, have to use. But So this simulate checklist goes through what kind of things you'd want to um, look for in a paper about simulation modeling. And then there's a, a growing movement to incorporate discrete event simulation modeling, which I'll talk about, into quality improvement efforts in healthcare systems. So again, I think we're going to start to see more and more of this in the medical literature. A lot of it's been in the engineering literature, but, but it's coming. So I just wanted to go over briefly the, the tools. When we talk about health system engineering, what are the tools that we're talking about? And this is from that same Institute of Medicine document. Um, and so they can be divided into three categories of tools. Systems design tools are tools that um, allow us to create systems that meet the needs of stakeholders. So these would be examples of the type of tools they would use, concurrent engineering, quality functional deployment, human factors research, failure analysis, um, et cetera. And so examples of this would be, you know, if we were to design, let's say, an electronic health record, you know, human factors research would be very useful to understand how we interact and how we interface with that system to design it in a way that's, that's most useful. Systems analytic tools are those that help us understand how complex systems operate and how they can be approved. So these would be things like queuing, um, simulation, supply chain management, and predictive modeling. 
And finally, systems controls tools are ones that once we've got a system in place and, and it's operating within um, parameters that we prescribe, how do we make sure that it keeps operating within those parameters? And that's when we use things like statistical process control, Six Sigma, and others. So again, a number of different tools that, you know, when we think about health systems engineering are, are tied into that. And I'll just focus on one in particular that we've been working with, which is discrete event simulation. But, but again, a lot of other potential um, tools. So what is discrete event simulation, or DES? It's a modeling methodology that simulates the operations of a system as a series of discrete events. And so this is very much suited to things like endoscopy or other procedural specialties where patients all move through a very a fairly uniform series of steps. Um, for example, endoscopy, patients all register, they all get prep, they all go to the procedure, and they all go to recovery. So again, it's very amenable to this kind of approach. The characteristics of the modeling approach, it models, again, discrete state changes. It takes into account the stochastic um, behavior of the system, so it takes into account variability, um, which is really important in healthcare, and it's dynamic. And so that Things that happen in the morning can be different than things that happen in the afternoon. Things that happen on Monday can be different than things that happen on Tuesday. And again, we can take all that into account when we, when we do the modeling. So it has a number of purposes. It's been used for decades in manufacturing, for long-range planning, operational efficiency, customer service, quality improvement, and others. I just um, have a picture here of the Eiffel Tower. And so this is a model that was created to look at flow of um, Initially, I said patients, but you know, flow of these are not patients; these are um, tourists through the Eiffel Tower. But again, that's the type of thing that you know has been used traditionally. Simulation has been used uh, traditionally for. But uh, you know, I would say that we could use modeling for the same purposes in healthcare. Again, planning efficiency, service quality improvement, and training. So a lot of the same purposes. And the reason that it's especially useful in healthcare, I think, that here's three three reasons. So the first is that healthcare is a complex system. We all know that. Um, but it's a system where, where there's not a linear relationship between action and effect. And so you may try and make a change in one particular area of the system and ha have no way to easily predict what happens into the other, uh, other areas. Um, and then the system itself takes on a life of its own. And so again, there's a lot of variability and complexity in, the, in healthcare. Um, Simulation is very useful for moving beyond averages. A lot of how we manage our current system is based on averages. So if you ask folks in the health system how they um, assign labor standards to a particular area, it's all based on averages. So what's the mean number of patients you see in a day? How many nurses do you need for that mean? And that's how you create your labor standards. So you can see how that, um, that, what that means is we are usually overstaffed or understaffed. Very rarely are you act adequately staffed in, in the current systems. And then finally, healthcare obviously has a lot of um, um, moving parts. There's certainly risk when you deal with patients. And so simulation allows us a chance to test interventions in a risk-free environment. So lots of potential advantages to simulation. Um, and this one, I think, again, sort of to go back to the who's on first idea, you know, I, I think the issue um, is that um, simulation also lets us get, get beyond this silo mentality. And so in endoscopy, for example, we have um, you know, we have nurses who operate in one silo, we have physicians who operate in another silo, and we have techs and, and clerks who operate in another silo. And you couldn't know what's going on in the other silo even if you tried. Um, and so simulation, again, gives us the chance to step back and kind of look at the system from an objective perspective, which I, which I have found the most um, useful um, characteristic of, of the technique. And it goes back to this. This is what Deming wrote in 19, um, which I guess is a few decades ago now. But, that a system cannot understand itself, the transformation requires a view from outside. And I really believe that. I think this is the reason why places like Duke call in Deloitte um, to help them transform. You know, even so, there's a lot of smart people at Duke who could um, think about the same things. Um, because it's very hard, again, to understand the system from the inside. And again, simulation is a way to kind of pull back and look at the system um, uh, for, with an external perspective. So any, any questions or comments? sort of feel like my son, who's recently gotten really obsessed with Legos. So sometimes I tell him, just take a breath. You know, like, you can finish this later. So I just want to make sure I give him one a chance. All right. OK. So, so with that background, I want to just give ex some examples of how we've used simulation to, to uh, tackle the question of efficiency in GI endoscopy, just with, a, um, with one case example. And I'll, um, I'll show another one in a little bit. 
So this one has to do specifically with this issue of um, what we call the continuous nursing paradigm in GI endoscopy. And the objective was to employ simulation to model, um, simulation modeling to evaluate the efficiency of a new nursing paradigm in GI endoscopy. And what is that? So traditionally, you know, we operate in endoscopy in these silo mentalities. So we have prep nurses, we have procedure nurses, and then we have recovery nurses. And those nurses are fairly location-centric. They don't really interact with each other. Um, and we staff, again, to those individual areas. And so one of our um, nurse managers had gone to a conference and had talked to some colleagues of hers who said that you know, they had tried this really cool thing where the nurses met the patients at the front door and then continued with them the entire process. And so instead of having location-centric, um, the nurses were operating in a patient-centric manner. And the idea here is that you are eliminating a patient handoff, which you presume will improve efficiency, but also we imagine would improve patient satisfaction and probably safety. Um, and so this was something that they really wanted to try. Um, the concern, of course, was, you know, did we have enough staff to do that? What would be the impact on efficiency? What are we going to do our volumes? Oh, no, it's too scary. Let's not do it. And so we said, well, why don't we try and model it and try and make predictions about what would happen and then use that model to inform, you know, whether or not we actually institute this in practice. So that's what we did, and um, I'll just go through a couple of the steps by which we do that to give you a sense of how we do it. And so the first step is always to draft a conceptual model of the endoscopy unit. This is when you bring um, all the stakeholders together to really come to an understanding about what the, what the model system looks like. So what we have here is a flow of patients from registration um, to prep to one of seven procedure rooms, which you can see here. Uh, and then to recovery. So at its highest level, that's how simple it is. And then we start to add layers of complexity where for each of these steps, we indicate the resources required. So PrEP has eight rooms and four nurses. Each of the procedure rooms has one nurse, one tech, and one physician, with the exception of these two rooms, which has one physician running between two rooms, four and five. Um, and then recovery, which has 12 rooms and four nurses. So. That's the level of complexity that we um, use for this model. You can, again, as you imagine, get much more complex where you could say, OK, we have this number of scopes. And um, you know, on Monday, it looks like this. But on Tuesday and Wednesday, it looks like that, um, et cetera. So you can get really detailed. But this was the model we used for this particular question. Um, and then within the procedure room, which are highlighted in these blocks, you had three different steps. So there was the sedation, the procedure itself, and then the post-procedure. So for each of those timestamps, we then wanted to collect time data that mapped to those events. We had probation, which is the endoscopy report writer system at that time, where the nurses were automatically collecting timestamps. And once we had those timestamps and you collect a certain number, you can create a distribution um, to understand um, the variability in procedure time. So this is upper endoscopy over here on the left and colonoscopy on the right. And um, you can see that if you just use average, so the average time for an EGD is somewhere around 10 minutes. Um, but you can see that doesn't really speak to what actually happens because we've got sometimes these procedures are, uh, take 60 minutes or more. And it's those tails that really throw off a day. Um, it's the variability that causes chaos in the healthcare system. It's not the mean. You know, so that's why understanding the variability is really important. So again, colonoscopy again, 25 minutes, but that doesn't speak to these procedures that are canceled and then these procedures that are really complex that might go on to 60 minutes. So for each of these steps, if you go back to the each, um, each of these arrows, we create a distribution that, that um, tells us how long it takes to go from one step to the next. So in the same way that with a Markov model, you'd have a probability distribution for a particular state change. Again, this just uses time-based distributions for each of those steps. So once we do that, we set an appointment template. And the details here aren't important. But um, when we did this work, we had to create uh, an arrival um, template for patients. Um, now we're able to pull that directly from the EHR. But once you have all that together, you can then create a model. And this we use, you know, we, we use Simio, which is, um, allows some, some animation for the modeling. You don't necessarily have to use the animation. But I just wanted to give you an example of this to show you the type of information that we can glean. So this is our 2H, this is the Duke South endoscopy unit. Here's registration up here. We have eight, as I mentioned, um, prep bays, 12 recovery bays, which are on this side, and then seven procedure rooms, which are along the bottom. And again, this model was based on all the data that I talked about, the appointment template we put in, the um, times for the various steps, the staff, et cetera. And so you, I'm going to run the model just for a minute so you can see what happens. We'll go from 8.30 in the morning to 9.30 in the morning. This is a single run. And as you might imagine, when we want to get statistics from this, we'll run it 100 times or 1,000 times to get, to get statistics uh, and output. So I'm just going to run it for just briefly so you can see how. 
And this is just a visual representation. Obviously, the numbers are, are what matter most. But the visualization does help you in a number of ways. So you can identify, for example, in these two rooms. This is room four and five. This is one physician running between two rooms. You can already start to see what happens to this patient right here when you have one physician running two rooms. So that has an impact on room utilization. It has an impact on patient waiting time. It has an impact on volumes. You can see that very nicely in the model. Um, and the other thing I want to point out is in recovery. So this is our recovery space here. And in a minute, you'll start to see that space fill up. And um, this is a common issue we hear among, um, from the nurses to say that you know, there's a bottleneck in recovery. I can't get my patient out of this room mid-morning because all the patients that came at the same time in the morning are filling up my recovery space. So you can imagine if you're a person sitting here in recovery, you can see all your bays full. It can be sort of overwhelming. Um, but this is a real wall here, right? So nobody can tell that the entire prep area, save one bay, is empty. Um, and so, again, the point here is that there's an ability. So one of the lessons from this work was that having a shared prep and recovery space allows efficiencies between staff and room. And again, this is something that um, is not rocket science, but um, it, again, has to have us kind of step out of the system to sort of see that. And the animation allows us to do that. Um, so that was one of the side products of this work. You know, we sort of um, developed this idea of shared space and is one that you can develop and, and develop some generalizable knowledge from the work. All right, so to get back to the question at hand, we chose four outcomes to look at um, between these different scenarios. We looked at flow time, which is time from um, preparation start to procedure completion. We looked at nurse utilization, procedure room utilization, and then patient waiting time, just a set of metrics that we developed for this particular question. And so we can then use the model to create a set of statistics. So this is baseline data you can see in this chart. Um, room utilization around 65%, prep nurse utilization to 46%. Procedure nurse utilization close to 80. Um, patient waiting time about 24 minutes. And then flow time about 111 minutes. So then we can then alter the model, or create a new model rather that, that reflects the continuous nursing paradigm. So this is the baseline. We can do the continuous paradigm. And you can see that numbers don't change. So we can answer the question, which is we don't think that, you know, we think that you have sufficient staff to um, enact this continuous nursing paradigm. And it won't impact um, efficiency. And then we can do a sensitivity analysis where we say, you know what, we think we're going to save time in patient handoff time, so anywhere from 0 to 50% time saved in the room. And we can then make predictions about what the impact of that would be on these metrics. So we know room utilization would drop, nurse utilization would drop, patient wait, patients would wait less, and we would be able to have more space to do additional procedures. Um, so again, this allowed us to answer the question, which was, yes, you have the staff to do it. Yes, we think um, it'll save time. And you know, the, the magnitude of the benefit will depend on, on um, how much time you save from the patient handoff. And that's not something that we can predict, but something that we would want to observe. So it all looks good. And um, I'll just mention that this fits nicely, too, in this conceptual framework for efficiency. And we um, have really thought about efficiency in the same way that you'd think about other quality metrics, in the same way you'd apply, this is Don Abedian paradigm of structure, process, and outcome to quality measures, you do the same thing to efficiency. So we've demonstrated how a change in structure, that is nurse reorganization, has impacted outcomes in terms of throughput, utilization, and waiting time um, mediated by prep time. So again, I think it really nicely illustrates the use of this framework for look, thinking about efficiency. Um, so, so then you say, oh, it looks good, but did we do it? No, we didn't do it. The unit didn't do it. Um, and, and that has to do with this implementation gap, right? And, and the literature in health system engineering is full of this same problem, where you can create a model and predict um, a change, and then nothing happens with that model. Um, and that's a, you know, this is sort of the classic implement well, not classic, but this is what, we, what, we, what I call the implementation gap, um, where we can't translate research findings into practice. And I think that's driven in this area by two issues. One is data. Um, so it, it takes a lot of time and effort to collect this time data, and that's been an impediment. And the second is change management. This goes back to um, what, what Kevin, um, I think it was Seth Glickman, wrote a while back about the importance of organizational um, in, um, structure to the success of, of quality improvement programs. Um, it is very difficult to change people's minds in healthcare, and um, that has to do with clinical practice and it has to do with the operations side as well. The implementation gap that we've encountered, and, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're, um, I think, going to address this data gap, 
And then the change management gap is really the focus of my career development award to think about what are the barriers and facilitators to implementation of, of, of simulation um, in systems redesign. So um, I don't know how easy it'll be to overcome this gap, but, but I do want to talk a little bit about um, one success story. So it can be done. This is some work by um, Eugene Day. He used to be at the VA and now is at the Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania. He's an engineer by training. Um, and he's done some really nice work using simulation modeling to address operational issues. And this is a paper that uh, is in press where he modeled um, at CHOP there um, is a hybrid OR room. And that room can be used for either CAT procedures or OR. Um, and it had been used on Fridays. Um, and the problem was that patients who were having elective cardiac procedures were getting bumped because the SICU basically was full. And so the question was, how could they reorganize their um, process to, to decrease the number of bumps um, for these electric um, procedures? So they created a model, same sort of approach we took. Um, and this is their data. I just want to show it. So they varied the day which, which this hybrid room was going to be used. So instead of using it on Friday, which is the baseline, they said we could use it on Friday and we could add an extra bed in the SICU, or we could change it and use the hybrid room on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And using the model, they made predictions about what the annual rate of postponements would be um, in that scenario and found a relative reduction of 16% if they moved the hybrid day to Wednesday. Right? Um, and so they've actually had success. So they've implemented this change. And they've noticed over a five-month period a drop uh, from, uh, of bumps from an expected rate of 10 to only 2 in that time period. Um, and so time will tell about whether that, you know, that, that reaches statistical significance and what happens over the course of the year. But, but this is the type of work, again, that I think is, shows the successes of simulation in a way that um, you can use the modeling to make predictions, implement those, and then realize the benefits. So it's possible. It just takes buy-in. And this all work, by the way, is all, is all funded by CHOP, right? So the hospital funds um, all of this work. So um, in the last uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so, I want to talk about the use of the electronic health record as a key source of data for systems engineering. This gets back to this um, gap that I talked about in terms of the data gap. Um, and this has to do, so we were funded by DHI, which is the Duke Institute for Health Innovation, to pilot the, the concept or the approach of simulation guided systems redesign. And to do that, we were going to have um, sort of two parallel work streams. One was going to be focused on the creation of an efficiency dashboard in endoscopy. Um, and the second would be actually to use simulation modeling to guide systems redesign. And they both um, started with this idea of identifying timestamps within the EHR that would allow the identification of critical timestamps. And then um, in this um, work stream, we'd develop metrics around it. And in this work stream, we would actually develop modeling to answer operationally relevant questions. So to do that, we went back to the 2H unit. We um, again created another flow map, and this time added a number of different layers, again, to reflect the complexity of the unit. Um, so each of these steps um, correlates to a process within the unit. So check-in, pre-procedure start, pre-procedure complete, et cetera, uh, all the way to recovery complete. We modeled activities in the individual room and the individual prep bays as different modules within that model. And then also included the addition of a CRNA, which is a nurse anesthetist in that model, too. Um, and so in creating this activity network or kind of a matrix, we are able to identify the critical timestamps in patient flow. And we then went to EPIC, which, as everybody knows, is our um, electronic health record. And OpTime is the module that we used um, uh, at Duke to, um, to manage endoscopy flow. And connected, or mapped, rather, uh, each data element or a data element in OpTime to each of the critical time intervals in our flow. And so you could see that check-in had, had this particular OpTime data element. Pre-procedure start had this one. And we did that for all. I don't know how many of these 12 or 13 um, different timestamps um, in this process. Um, and that was, you know, we thought that would be the easy part, but that took, you know, six months to, to do. And a part it was because um, these 12 um, op time data elements were in 14 different tables in Epic. So you had to sort of connect all those tables to find them, and then you had to, we had to validate them and, um, and then assure uniform standard. Uh, flow and workflow. So, but, but we were able to do it. And, and what that allowed us to do was to start to create these key performance indicators or metrics for endoscopy. And so um, this just examples the type of work we did. So red is our Duke South unit. Blue is our Briar Creek unit. 
We now have data at all five of the different endoscopy units across the institution, so we can compare utilization across the different units. So we looked at things like utilization and first case on time start and waiting room time and room turnover. Um, and you can see where the metrics are. But, but rather the details and the numbers, I just wanted to highlight that the, that the amount of data we have is pretty extraordinary and allows us to do a lot of things around operations. So we can look at overtime. This is the number of minutes of overtime in the Duke, in the Duke South unit. This is in July when EPIC was instituted. You can see that um, we were up here at 900 minutes in a month. We were able to get that down. Um, and then it went slightly back up um, when anesthesia joined our unit in February. And you can see it stabilized around 400 minutes or so. But compared to Briar Creek, which is our ambulatory surgical center, which has basically zero minutes of overtime for most of the year. Um, so we, again, could dig even deeper in and then go by room. So if we have seven rooms, they have funny names, but um, there's only seven rooms, but there's a room eight. But, but if you look at um, each of these rooms, you can see that um, it turns out that it's actually room two and three that are the problem rooms. It's actually always on Tuesday. So we can really start to dig down and understand what's happening on Tuesday in room two and three and, and really have kind of a focused impact on, um, on wait times. So um, that's just kind of the, uh, the efficiency metrics. We also looked at these operational questions around first case start time. Um, so for, I'll give you an example. So Deloitte came in and said, all you have to do is start on time. And if you start on time, you'll end on time. And um, you know, we sort of said, well, I don't know, it doesn't really make sense to us. And they said, no, trust us. We have years of experience in this. So we said, well, we're just going to model it and wonder whether that's true. So if we model starting on time, does that really mean that you end faster? Um, we looked at case averaging in terms of how we could construct template strategies that used physician-specific times for templates rather than everybody getting 45 minutes for a colonoscopy. Um, can we uh, create a more um, precise appointment template? And then we looked at um, some other things that we, I don't have data to show you, but um, flipping rooms in terms of how many rooms you use per doctor. And then um, another concept of cellularization, which I'll talk about. So again, to do this, same sort of approach, we can create a conceptual model. In this case, the conceptual model was really focused on a particular room. And so we wanted to just understand what happened in room two. So the way we constructed our conceptual model was just focused on the flow in room two. Um, we Our inputs for the model, we've got time distributions all from the EMR, as I mentioned. And now we're actually able to download appointment templates directly from the EMR as well. And so we can um, really, to allow us to have more hi higher fidelity modeling, we can actually use the EMR to, to pull the appointment templates. And then we got staffing levels from subject matter experts and resource constraints. Um, we created a model which we validated using external data so we can compare flow time in the model, which is in the blue, to flow time um, in real life. And so you can see that these track fairly nicely together. And so we were able to show that these models we created for Tuesday and Wednesday really reflected um, flow in the unit. And um, then we can look at various questions. So I'm just going to give you some examples of the type of work we're, um, we did. So if you look at first case start, um, we found actually that only about a third, it's probably a little higher than that, it was about 45% of patients arrived within 60 minutes of their scheduled appointment. So we tell everyone, you've got to come an hour before your appointment so we can get you prepped for your procedure. Only about 40% of people actually do that. Uh, and we modeled that and said, well, if only if everybody's available 30 minutes before, you're only going to be able to start on time 28% of the time. You really need people there at least an hour to have a high proportion of people who are going to start on time based on the modeling. And so um, we then changed the appointment letter to highlight the importance or need of 60-minute prep time. We've changed the reminders to patients. And we are looking at the percent who arrive at least 60 minutes early. So the outcome, obviously, would be do patients arrive on time. And some preliminary data, you know, I don't, we don't, this was just started in December, so we don't have a lot of data to show. I can tell you, though, that the number has crept up some for what it's worth. We're up at 65% now. Um, the other thing, which I don't have data to show you, is that when you create a model that has every patient of the day arriving at 8 in the morning um, and starting on time, uh, sorry, so if you have the first patient of the day arriving on time and starting on time, and you compare that to a model where everybody is available at 8 o'clock in the morning, and so um, you'll find that the biggest impact on the end of day is driven more by the template than on time start. And so the modeling allows us to say, even if you get everybody on time, the problem is you still have your appointment template set up incorrectly, and that's what's driving your late, your late days. So anyway, again, just an example of the type of, of um, questions we can address with the modeling. The other thing we did was look at case averaging. So we found that um, 
Our fixed templates create inefficiencies in unit flow. So we know that colonoscopies take anywhere from 20 minutes to 65 minutes, depending on who's doing them. Um, but everybody has a 45-minute template. So again, what that means is that most of the time, you're going to have colonoscopies that are too short or too long for the slot. And so we went back and looked at everybody, every physician's times over the course of the year, created an uh, individualized template for each of those physicians. And the modeling analysis suggested that we could vary volume by one to two cases up or down. Um, we wouldn't go over time and we'd decrease patient waiting time as a result. Um, we also looked at the impact of room turnover time on that. So if you look at two doctors, this is Dr. A. On average, if you assume a 10-minute turnover time, can do eight, let's say, eight procedures a day on average. Dr. B um, can do 11 procedures in a day. Um, and the impact of turnover time, this was important because we were um, uh, in an initiative to try and decrease turnover time in the unit. If you double that turnover time to 20 minutes, you decrease the number of procedures by one for Dr. A and by two for Dr. B. Um, and so this highlighted, again, the importance of turnover time and, and helped us kind of push the, that um, that sort of concept in the, in the redesign process. So in terms of intervention, we've, we've proposed and now implemented a new scheduling policy for 2H. We've piloted and now we have fully um, turned on case averaging for physicians within 2H. So as of February 1st, everybody's got these new templates. And we'll be looking at over the next six months what happens to procedure volume, staff overtime, and patient wait time as examples of um, some of the outcomes we're looking at. So other things that we'd like to look at that we haven't had a chance yet would be this concept of cellularization. So the idea here is that we have a very complex unit structure. And there's a reason why Briar Creek has no overtime and Duke South has overtime. Um, it's because Duke South is a much more complex unit. So can we break up 2H into pods, for example, of two rooms, which would simplify um, operations? And so the questions would be, how would such a unit operate? What are the staffing needs? How would you schedule patients? So those are the types of questions, again, that modeling would be very useful for. Um, and again, the, the, the idea here is to move towards this concept of simulation guided systems redesign, is that it's not that the model itself is the answer to the question, but the process of modeling actually has, has a great deal of value. And then, and then um, the ability to ask the what if scenarios can be really useful. And so can we take this PDCA cycle, which has been used for systems redesign, um, and accelerate it through the use of modeling or even supplant it actually with, with a model instead of these small tests of change. So instead of thinking about something to do and to, to change it every, every two months, we would use the model to help guide that process. And the idea here is a rapid learning healthcare system, right? In the same way that we want to use data to guide clinical decisions, we want to use data to guide operational decisions. And so it's the same concept. So in summary, um, uh, simulation modeling is a powerful health system engineering tool for systems redesign. Implementation of systems engineering methods enables evidence-based management and rapid learning. I think, again, in the same way that we apply that to clinical processes. Um, and ongoing challenges to implementation of simulation include access to time data and organizational readiness for change. Those are real, real challenges and ones that um, we look forward to addressing. So I do want to acknowledge a number of people. Javed Tahari and Stephen Roberts are um, engineering faculty at NC State that I've worked with for the last several years. Um, I've had some great partners at Duke. Um, mentors on my VA Career Element Award are here, Don Provenzali, George Jackson, and Melissa Parton. Um, and then obviously I want to recognize Shelby, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> to recognize Shelby, um, Andrew, and, and Kevin Schulman, who've been very supportive over the years. And I, and I will have to say that DCRI is one of the few places, I think, where you can do this type of work. Um, and because it's non-traditional, um, it took some creativity to get it funded, but it was funded. I wasn't on the dole. I'll just say that here. I'm not on the dole. But, um, but again, it's, um, this is sort of you know, higher risk because it's not something that's been uh, widely um, published. So I do appreciate that chance. And so I leave you with this quote from Dr. Osler from Johns Hopkins, who um, was the first chief of medicine at Hopkins. He'd probably be. Um, turning over in his grave if, if I was presenting this about operational efficiency. But um, it is true. I think, I think this matters to patients. I don't think we should underestimate the importance of efficiency and timeliness to patients' experience about the quality of their care. And um, um, so I, I, th I think it's something that we should focus on. And um, I think that's it. Thanks very much. <laughs> Happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much. Yeah. Any, uh, any
Any thoughts or questions from folks out here? I mean, you mentioned sort of the, the access to data being a major barrier, sort of yeah. presuming more of that data is available through electronic health records. Yeah. Like, how, how easy is it for someone to conduct this simulation modeling, and sort of like how scalable is that? Um, yeah, yeah, so that's a good question. So one of the, one of the tasks of the microremolar award is to think through that question, because the, the process of modeling is very time intensive, as you might imagine. Um, there are ways to create models that are, that are more generalizable. And so we can, instead of creating one model that takes the flow from start to finish, you can create a series of models. So we could have a model for um, prep. We can have a model for procedure. We can have a model for recovery. And the, in that modular design, you can try and mix and match to make it a little more generalizable. Um, the other thing is, which some companies have done, is to create an Excel interface with a model. So can you make an, a model generalizable enough that you can have an Excel spreadsheet to just put the data in and then get a result back? I think you lose the, one of the benefits of simulation, which is the process by which you create it. You learn a tremendous amount about the system. Um, but, um, but, you know, so we can use this for every unit within Duke, for example. So we have now data for all the units at Duke. We can apply the same model to those units since our workflows are pretty much the same. So, so the model for dissemination or for, you know, is basically to create models that allow that modular approach and to have uniform um, workflows so that we have, you know, the data that we collect is meaningful. Shelby. So I'm interested in hearing more about your career development board and that you're planning to examine barriers to implementation and yes. what are your plans for going about that? Yeah, so the, so the um, the Kurt Ullman Award, um, which, is, which is five years, which I'm very excited about, <laughs> but is, is, is a dual systems engineering and an implementation science proposal. So the system engineering approach really is asking, how do you create models that allow easy dissemination? And so how do we create a model that we can take in our unit at the VA endoscopy unit and then use at other VAs across the country without having to spend six months recreating the unit? So that's the systems design part. The second piece of the systems design part is to compare different methods. So when is simulation the right approach? When is queuing a better approach? You know, when can you just use lean, for example? Um, and so understanding what the right tool is for the particular redesign problem is a key piece of the um, systems engineering education of the Credulment Award. On the implementation side, um, it's really, again, about how do you, what does it take to institute this kind of process within the VA? Uh, specific to the VA, but it can be applied to non-VA settings. And so it would be, um, uh, for example, a focus group. So we ask patients, what is, what is important to you when it comes to timeliness of care? You know, what's important to you about flow? What do you notice about flow? We would also have focus groups um, and interviews with key staff, nurses, physicians, administrators within to say, you know, how willing are you to redesign the unit? What would it take? What kind of evidence do you need to be convinced that this is something worth doing? Those sorts of questions. And so it's designed to be a um, pre-implementation evaluation, so before we do the intervention, then during the intervention, how cumbersome was this? How much time did it take? Did you find the data useful? Did you have to wait too long to get the data to make operational decisions, which is one of the problems um, with the modeling? And then afterwards is, did the model reflect what you thought was going to happen? And um, those sorts of questions. So it's in really two parallel work streams. Um, and the implementation is just understanding what does it take to do this, and how easy would it be to go to other VAs? as well. And then other places, right? There's no reason why we couldn't do this in the cath lab, or we couldn't do in dialysis. A lot of, a lot of work's been done in the ORs, uh, OR, the ER, um, and endoscopy. Um, there's been a couple papers on like balloon, um, this was for the cardiologists in the room. I see, I see a lot of fellows, but um, you know, door to balloon time, for example. So any time-based quality metric in medicine, this, this would be a really nice system. So can you, there's a paper that used modeling to look at door to balloon time and how you would change parameters to try and optimize that. Yeah. What the issue is the quality and fidelity of the EHR derived data. Yeah. Can you speak a little bit about what you did to validate that data or and or improve the quality of the data? Yeah. Yeah, it's really important. So we did when we when we um, mapped each of those time elements to to the process flow. We um, to do that we you know, used our own experience, but then went back and sat in the endoscopy unit for a day and said, okay, what are the nurses clicking at these particular times? And so that's how we came up with that. And then after doing that, we then created a, a, a worksheet or a standardized workflow, and we asked all the nurses to, to use that same workflow 
Um, and that's been, you know, that's where an operational partner is obviously critically important because they've pushed that. And so now at all our endoscopy units, the workflow is the same. The nurses are pushing the same buttons to mean the same things, and that's critically important because it, you know, this is the challenge of taking it somewhere else is that I, another unit that uses Epic, I can't guarantee that they're pushing the button at the same time as we would be pushing the button. So that becomes a problem. But it took a while, and that's why it, it took longer than we thought to do that validation process and to collect the data. But now, you know, again, we have a system where we can just pull this data at any time, and we have thousands of colonoscopies to build these distributions now. I really liked how you took uh, your clinical experience and painful points in there to yeah. sort of, um, you know, uh, inspire your research. One of my painful points is 2B2C clinic where we take care of kidney transplant patients, and the system that they're engaged in starts long before they step into the clinic, yeah. the parking lot, getting to Duke. Yeah. Um, have people ever sort of tried to take into other factors of getting care in a health system like the parking and, and, right. and all the front yeah. staff and so forth? Yeah, so um, there, there actually, so there's a really interesting study that was just funded by PCORI actually, looking at the process of um, colorectal cancer screening. So it took a step back. So, you know, we're looking, we look just at the endoscopy unit. In that grant, actually, they're looking at the entire process of getting colorectal cancer screening. So what does it take to improve access to colorectal cancer screening in the community? So they'll model the time it takes to get, you know, a fecal occult blood test and how long it takes to get a colonoscopy and then how long it takes to get in the unit and those sorts of things. So we can work at, at different levels. Um, the, the UNOS um, uh, system for allocating liver transplant actually is a, is a discrete event simulation model as well. So it doesn't necessarily have to be just focused on operational questions within the unit. It can be used for other time dependent processes. Um, a lot of traditional operations research work looks at parking lots and looks at um, vaccination clinics, what's the best way to vaccinate a community, for example? How would you do that? In fact, my collaborators at, at NC State had a CDC grant to look at what would be the best way to vaccinate um, a community in, the out, in, in, in an outbreak, for example. You know, so that would be, a, you could use a time-dependent model for that. So you could, again, you could ask any question that, that has time-dependent variables to it, you could use um, simulation modeling or queuing or another approach. So in, in, in doing this, you've probably looked at a number of different examples. What's your favorite example of where you saw um, simulation-based modeling for discrete events like you described, um, you know, demonstrate some surprising findings that then were acted on in yeah. a meaningful way? Well, you gave one example, I imagine yeah. there's others. Yeah, so that, that's, the, um, that's the gap. That's the literature gap, right? So that's, um, so a career development award would not have been funded if the question was we want to learn how to develop models because a lot of people have done that. The, the real value here is that how do you then implement them and then, and then publish them and not a lot of people have taken that step because this has predominantly been an engineering discipline and it's, it's a, very, a group of very smart engineers who realize that healthcare is a big market and the market could use these skills but no one sort of made that translation. Um, and so um, Eugene Day, who I mentioned, he's done some really interesting work where he's actually implemented a lot of the changes. Um, I do have a colleague at UCSF who did some work in GI, and they looked at changing the appointment templates and staffing models for, for their unit, and they've had some success. Um, but there's not, a lot of good, there's not a lot of good examples of ways in people have instituted the, the model. I think the UNOS model as a discrete event simulation model has been the most successful because that's a way in which people have applied a model and had a real clinical impact. And that's real the challenge. So the challenge really is how do I make this work clinically relevant? Because people always push back and say we're not interested in operations, we're interested in healthcare quality. You know, so that, that's a real challenge. Great. Well, thanks for a wonderful presentation. Thanks for coming. Thank you.